could everybody just introduce themselves, please, and say what their role is? Sure, we can do that. Um, so I'm Mark Barlow, North District City Councilor and Chair of this committee. Yes. And I'm Gene Gergen. <laughs> I'm a Washington City Councilor and a member of this committee. I'm Hannah King. I'm the Ward 8 City Councilor, also a member of this committee. And how does one become a member? You're oh. Appointed by the city. This is a this is a committee of the city council, and we're appointed by the city council president. So you have to get elected first. You have to get elected first, and then you have to um, be chosen by the city council president to be a member of the city. Um, so for oh, I'm the public, <laughs> excuse me, I'm the public. Uh, are you here to speak on an item? Yes. Um, is it on the carbon pollution impact fee? <laughs> Okay, um, so we're going to open public forum for, and I'll ask those watching online um, if you have comment on the uh, carbon pollution impact fee question. Um, if you were going to have another uh, opportunity for public comment when we take that item up. So if you wanted to hold those now, um, that would be, I think, preferable. If you have to leave, I understand, and you, can, you could. Raise your hand and be recognized now. Um, so uh, with that in mind, um, also, if you're here to speak on other items besides the uh, current pollution impact big question, this would be the time to speak. So those who want to speak on that other item, the current pollution impact big and any other uh, committee business. So with that, I'll open up the public forum. Um, so we have someone, we have two people in the room. Um, they want to speak on matters now? Sure. Okay, okay. go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Steve, good time. Is there, where's the camera? Over here, Steve. I'm a resident of the former Public Works Director and City Engineer. Uh, tonight, you've got a proposal before you to put an item to the voters. It doesn't say when, but the idea being to update something the voters did several years ago. And I think um, I think we've learned a lot even in the last couple, three years, and I believe it's a consensus, if not the unanimous opinion of the city council right now, that it's not just fossil fuels that are the issue, it's carbon-based fuels that are the issue. I think the whole discussion around the seed pipe and the resolution came out of that made it pretty clear that the city really needs to look at carbon, not just fossil fuels. And the resolution that I think you're going to look at tonight to put this on the ballot is trying to update that and bring the city to a point where we're looking at carbon fuels and not passing an ordinance that only deals with certain fossil fuels, but will allow us to deal with everything. I think it's a good idea, especially since we haven't put the carbon impact fee into place yet. And I, all I can say is why not take a little bit more time and do it right? I think there's other ways to do it also, but if the city is set that that's the way it's going to do things, at least let's get it all in there and out there. And I think we all learned a lot from the steam pipe discussion that uh, it's really carbon and CO2 that we have to look at and not just fossil fuels. So I would encourage you to take the time. If it can't get on the agenda that I got to the voters in March, I think someone is indicated that there may be two other opportunities for the voters to do something before town meeting day or after town meeting day for other issues so it isn't like it has to go on it's not like it can't go on and we can't take a little more time if you need it i don't think it takes a lot of time to think if i were voting i would approve this but if it takes a little bit longer i urge you to do that before you put the ordinance into effect to really be kind of only a half measure if you don't address all the carbon and again, that's what we're going to be doing so thank you Thank you, Steve. Would you like to speak? Yes. Can you state your name for the record? Yes, my name is Carol Tansy, and I am a resident of Burlington. I moved here from Albany, New York, um, because um, I wanted to be closer to my family who had lived in Burlington. Um, so I'm a political woman. And I essentially agree with the gentleman who preceded me uh, that fossil fuels 
are um, that the McNeil plant has issues with fossil fuels and the definition of fossil fuels. It's not biofuels, but just generating carbon. And um, so the physics is that um, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks about carbon and what people think carbon is. It's the fact that to release carbon into the air is to increase climate change and climate crisis. So COP28 um, was a cop out as far as I'm concerned. And um, I'm concerned about the releasing of more carbon. Thank you. And the way the air and the weather has been impacted. Um, Thank you, Carol. Yes. Um, is there anybody online who wants to speak about items other than the um, the carbon pollution impact fee question? There are two uh, people with their hand raised. Okay. Luce Hillman. Luce Hillman. Can you hear me? Hillman. Yes. Hillman, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Luce Hillman. I'm with the University of Vermont, and I do want to speak on the. Hi, Luce. Let's see. Oh. Hang on. Sorry. Can you hear me? No. Luce, can you? Okay, sorry. There you are. Luce, we can hear you online. I think they're having a hard time in the room. Okay. What is, do you know, Laura, what I need to do to change the setting? I don't think that? it's you. They just need to change a setting or okay. enable something. Go ahead, Luce. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Hi. I want to speak about the carbon impact fee, but of course, like everybody probably, I have a 7 p.m. board meeting. Um, in another town. So I just, uh, I don't know if you're going to be at that point by that time. We will be trying to wrap by six today. So if, if you wanted to hold, there'd be an op opportunity and I'm guessing. I will hold. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll come back to you. Anyone else? Sarah, you should be allowed to unmute. Hi, Um, can you hear me? Hi, Sarah. Go ahead. Yes, we can. Hey, um, I do want to just super briefly um, ask the councillors present to vote um, in favor of adding the climate pollution impact fee to the ballot. Um, that'll be all. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. And then Gary. Gary. Yes, like like Luz, I have a five thirty, but I can wait until then if that's okay. Okay. Very good. Um, and is there anyone else? No. There's not. So <laughs> we're going to move forward to the uh, first deliberative uh, agenda item, which is um, the Winooski Bridge replacement update. And I think we have more we want to look at the Yep. So we have a very robust team here. I'm Laura Wheelock. I'm a senior public works engineer with the city of Burlington. Also here is our director, Chapin Spencer. And on the uh, additionally on the municipal side, Maddie Sender is one of the project representatives. I'm going to give it to Bob uh, or Carolyn, I guess, maybe Bob, to give an introduction to the project. Hi, Hi everyone. I'm Bob Kleinfelter. I'm the uh, project manager with the VTrans structure section for the bridge portion of the project. Um, we also have here Carolyn Cota Structures Program Manager, and then Mike LaCroix is on the line. He's the project manager for the intersection portion of the project. Um, then we have Josh Owen from HNTB and Steve Spear from HNTB. And I'll let uh, Josh take it away for the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Bob. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes, we yeah. can see. 
I did it. All right. So I'm going to walk you through the presentation tonight. It's um, it's not going to be a lot of new information compared to some of the stuff we've shared at the public meeting in September. There's a little bit of advanced things, but we're really going to get into some more um, new things as we move forward here over the next month with the next public meeting. So um, I'll walk through this uh, where some of it might be a little bit familiar. I'll try to go a little bit quicker. Or some of it's new, I'll try to take a little bit more time, and then maybe we'll just take questions at the end if there are any. Sounds good. Excellent. So we've already done introductions, uh, so I'll skip right past that. So tonight, I really want to take a little time just to kind of refresh everybody about where the project is and what the boundaries are. Talk a little bit about some of the past efforts on this job, what we're currently focused on, and then where we're heading with this project altogether. So starting right off here at the project location, um, just a quick reminder, it's right up at the border between Burlington and Winooski over the Winooski River. It's situated just a little bit to the west of the I-89 crossing um, and serves right around 25,000 vehicles each day. Kind of taking a, a little bit of a closer look here, we can take an aerial view of the project site itself. And of course, we see it's, it's a busy place. We've got a dam off to the southwest corner. We've got some buildings off to the southeast corner and kind of a, a roadway and private parking lot for the mill building down there. Across the river into a new ski, we've got kind of a, res, um, a decking area. We've got an apartment complex to the west. We've got another mill building to the right. So there's just a lot going on at this site. And to try to take a different look at this to really understand what the project is that we're talking about, we, we pull this contrast out. So generally speaking, this is the boundary of what we're looking at for the project. It's not super specific. It might grow a little bit, might shrink a little bit, but this is really the area we're focused on improving with this project. And there's really two focal points to what we're looking at. There's the bridge itself, and then there's the intersection in Burlington as well. And it's really hard to advance one without the other since they're so close and they have a lot of similar needs and goals behind them. So let's talk through the past efforts on each of those items. The bridge and the intersection were both advanced through a project definition phase or a scoping phase separate from one another. They generally progressed through that phase in a similar time frame, however, starting in around the April 2017 time frame and wrapped up somewhere around the May 2019 time frame. During that period, they both established a purpose and need. There was a lot of public meetings, public uh, project advisory committee meetings, city council meetings, lots of discussion. There was a traffic study, you know, alternatives evaluation, and eventually coming out the other end of that study was a preferred alternative being defined. Again, that happened separately. So there was a bridge alternative defined and separately an intersection alternative defined. And to generally wrap up the ends of those phases, we had a series of reports, one specific to the bridge, one specific to the intersection, and then a couple of years later, there was a separate grant application, which I like to include as a report because there are some other obligations within it that set the tone for where the project is heading. So just quickly touching upon what was in those reports, uh, I mentioned before that uh, the scoping studies wrapped up in 2019. And we have the scoping report here that was wrapped up and recommended a complete bridge replacement. So get rid of everything that's out there and put back all new infrastructure so that way you can get a nice 100 year service life in the end of the day. A lot of the focus of this scope and report was on bike and pedestrian accommodations, but it also went forward and touched upon conceptual construction methods, which we'll get into a little bit later. That with, with that complete replacement came with it a recommended geometry for the bridge. Here on the right side of the screen, we're looking at the existing bridge on the top and the proposed bridge on the bottom. You can see that the existing bridge has four lanes of traffic squeezed into about a 42 foot width between the gutter lines of the sidewalks. The proposed bridge moves forward with that four lane configuration and makes that overall travel way a little bit wider and a little bit more comfortable. Um, the biggest increase, however, is within those, those pedestrian areas, those shared use paths. The existing bridge has about six foot sidewalks. 
Moving forward, we're looking to include 12 foot multi-use paths for both pedestrians and bicyclists. So that's the biggest part of the widening of this bridge altogether. The intersection scoping report also wrapped up in 2019 with a lot of similar focuses on bike and pedestrian accommodations, mobility, and safety. The outcome of this report was to advance the project with a four-way intersection, which aligns Riverside across from Barrett Street. And that can be seen here conceptually in this image taken from that scoping report as well. Again, it's a consolidated intersection with improved mobility and an emphasis on bike pedestrian movements. If you look at the top side of this image though, you'll see that the roadway next down because again, this project was advanced without any sort of advancement of the bridge readily in, in eyesight. And then I mentioned there was a grant application that came forward a couple of years later. Within this grant application, kind of in return for receiving additional federal funds, there was this obligation to improve safety on the bridge, address bike and pedestrian accommodations, complement the natural and cultural environment, and really at the end of the day, provide an appealing bridge. So that's why I say I treat this almost as kind of a separate report because there are some obligations that drive the direction of this project. So all of that happened in the past. We had a lot of studying, a lot of outreach that ended up resulting in specific recommendations and preferred alternatives being defined. So now here we are moving forward and we're looking at really stitching together those two projects that were advanced separately. We've got the bridge and the intersection and we want to make them actually function as one kind of altogether holistic project. So that's the focus of our efforts at the moment. We are now in this project design phase or phase B of a typical development project, uh, process. And usually when we get into project design, we're looking at all the things you see here on the right, but really at the moment, we are heavily focused on just these top four, really refining that preferred alternative, working through some of the preliminary design, heavy focus on traffic control, just given the volume of traffic and pedestrians at this site, and starting to work through some of the right-of-way process. So what does this all look like? Well, to refine our preferred alternative, really what we need to start doing is get more outreach. And that's what we've been doing. We've had some, some public meetings, we've gone to the different events, we've had some stakeholder outreach, property owner meetings, initial utility meetings, and environmental coordination. We're trying to take as much information as we can gather to refine that alternative. And some of these little uh, little bubbles you see on the side are just some of the things we've been hearing from different people we talk to, whether it's bike ped safety or construction costs or schedule or aesthetics. It's all different comments we're collecting, reviewing, and seeing how it might continue to shape the project. We are working through preliminary design too, as I mentioned. The, the scoping report came out with some groundwork of what we want to advance the project with. But since that time, we've been able to collect ground survey and actually start putting real numbers and real engineering behind those concepts that we're moving forward. A big part of what we're doing as well is reviewing constructability. I mentioned there's a lot going on at that site. There's a lot of constraints. We're trying to figure out the best methods to actually construct this bridge and, and really secure the environmental permits and right of way to do so. As we've been getting into this preliminary design though, one other thing we are looking at is some different alignment variations, which some of them are conceptually shown here on screen just for graphical purposes. They aren't, these aren't set in stone, but we are looking at what happens when you replace a bridge completely on alignment versus a partial shift. And what does that mean for your different traffic control, phasing and costs associated with those items? So these are being explored and will be further discussed at the upcoming public meeting in January, but I wanted to share them here a little bit, just kind of as a sneak peek. One of the bridge phasing concepts that was presented in the scoping report, which is where this graphic comes from, uh, really focused on what's called a lateral slide technique. So in this situation, if you wanna follow me from kind of top to bottom on that right side of the screen, is you would start with the existing bridge, and build a little piece of the bridge next to it on the downstream side, so kind of on the dam side of the existing bridge. You'd set that little piece of the bridge in place, you'd transfer utilities, and then allow pedestrians and bicyclists to use this new portion of the bridge. In the meantime, you'd go upstream of the existing bridge, 
build the remainder of the new structure. And then when that's ready, you would actually close the road entirely to traffic, to vehicular traffic for about a four to six week duration. You'd then demolish the existing bridge, slide that new portion of the, uh, the new bridge into place, merge the two halves and then open it back up to traffic. And during this, pedestrians would be accommodated on that little piece downstream the entire time. So that's a concept that we're exploring with some of those alignments. There's some other phasing and different traffic operations that I'll get into as well at the upcoming public meeting. But traffic control definitely isn't something we're taking lightly. I mentioned there's 25,000 vehicles a day, roughly. There's also about 300 pedestrians a day, roughly. In looking at traffic control, we understand there's an absolute need to balance not just the impact of the traveling public, but also the contractor working on site and all their laborers. They need to have a safe and sufficient construction site to be able to perform their work. So as we go through this, we very much believe there's going to be a need to utilize a combination of temporary lane closures for very specific short-term activities, as well as perhaps that temporary bridge closure and that lateral slide technique that we talked about just a second ago. With the maintenance of traffic, of course, we are trying to figure out exactly what we have for the different crossings over the Winooski River in the area. How much traffic do they currently take? How much more could they absorb if a bridge were to be closed? And we're doing a, kind of an origin destination model to try to, it's, it's somewhat of a sensitivity analysis to figure out where those new vehicles would all of a sudden go if the bridge was closed. As far as a temporary detour, the shortest and seemingly most logical one is what we're showing here on screen. Of course, this isn't just something that we're just drawing a line on paper and wiping our hands of it and walking away. We understand that when you take 25,000 vehicles and put them onto these already very busy roads and intersections, there's going to be some other improvements and needs that have to happen in order to make any sort of detour of that magnitude successful. So there's a lot of different analyses going into the different detour, the different intersections and legs of this detour that you see here to understand if we need to make improvements for the short term closure. And once again, I want to reiterate that all pedestrians are maintained on site at the project during all times. And then finally, our other current focus right now is the right of way process. So we are going through and doing the deed research and the boundary mapping. We have met with a couple of property owners. We will continue to do that over the course of the spring as we start to refine what our impacts are, especially with the intersection. Once we get through that, we'll get into the appraisals and then ultimately into some offers and negotiations to secure the space to be able to construct this project. Which kind of brings us into future efforts. I'm already talking about things we're doing in the spring. So our, our future efforts will really focus on the bottom half of that list that I flashed on screen a while ago. So utility relocation, environmental permitting, and then really the contract development for when a contractor gets on board. So as far as utility relocation goes, uh, we've got a lot of exploration to, to go forward with. There's a lot of subsurface utilities out there. We're still mapping them, still trying to identify where they all are, what's abandoned, how deep are they, how many conduits. So we have some efforts happening now to pop manholes, and we have a subcontractor coming back later in the spring to do some test pits and try to really hone in on the location of all of those utilities. That'll help us identify conflicts and reduce risk for the contractor going forward as they really move forward with their operations. Um, utility agreements will then be made as well. And just to kind of emphasize that municipal utility relocations are project reimbursable. So as we come across those, uh, that'll be something else V Trains in the city will work through as well. Then environmental permitting. Um, this is something that's going to be an ongoing process over the coming year, year plus, is to really figure out exactly what we can do on site. So right now we're focused on trying to identify construction methods and impacts that will then transition into discussions with the permitting agencies to identify work windows and allowances and really come up with commitments. Um, the historic process or section 106, if you might have heard that, that's going to be a big focal point with different um, different outreach and coordination and input from the public, uh, as well as different, uh, different organizations within Burlington and Winooski. This is a historic bridge. There's an adjacent historic district out there. There's numerous historic properties. 
So it's a very sensitive area in terms of the cultural aspect of the project. And we're going to be marching forward with some very specific regulations around that too. And one of the next big things as well as we kind of get past defining the project is starting to build out the, the contract for this project. And we're using a, a construction method called design build contracting where our team is gonna take the design to a certain point where we can define what we believe is the footprint of the project, the impacts, and really kind of a design criteria, a, a shall and should type of situation where we tell a contractor what they need to do. Once we get to that point, the contractor and their designer kind of take the design over the finish line and put the finishing touches on to really meet the needs of the contractor and their specific tools and means and methods to provide a betterment to the project, lower cost, faster schedule, and more innovation. So why use design build contracting? Like I kind of just hinted at it a little bit, but it, it really promotes innovation. It allows the final design team and the contractor to put their heads together and really use the tools at their fingertip that they're comfortable with to push that project forward. Should improve both design and construction efficiencies, reduce cost and reduce schedule. So just for a quick comparison's sake, a traditional design build project, which is I'll say 95% of what VTrans does, puts VTrans kind of under the scope of doing all these things on the left, with the contractor just doing construction. And you can see down in my little, little graphic there, contracting happens very late in the development process. With a design build type of contracting, it sheds some of that effort that VTrans normally would do onto the contractor and pushes some of the risk with it. So all the final design and permitting goes to the contractor. And then a lot of the utility coordination and public outreach ends up kind of blending across the two. It allows us to pull that contracting time period forward and get the contractor on site earlier. So I get the question of, well, what does this mean? Why are you telling me this? It's really because we are trying not to fully define in detail every single aspect of this project as we march forward. What we are trying to do is put our arms around what the necessary boundaries and guides and shells and shoulds need to be on this project to tell the contractor what they need to adhere to, but allow them the flexibility to still come in and provide some innovation and cost and schedule efficiencies for the betterment of the project. But of course, with every project, the checks and balances with VTrans will be maintained. So we will still be guaranteed to have a product we're all happy with at the end of the day. So then in terms of just project delivery, just kind of wrapping it up here, um, Got the schedule here in front of us. This is just the first part of the schedule, and this is essentially everything that has happened to date. So we already talked through the project app starting off in 2017 and really kind of having that definition of what the project needs to be by in the middle of 2019. A couple of years went by as we tried to get some money for the project, and then a raise grant application happened in 2022. Now if we advance to the next part of the timeline, you can see that we're we're still pretty early in the project in terms of wrapping things up. Got the big old yellow, we are here flag there on the left side of the screen. This phase of the project where we're still defining or still, still developing the project and defining the contract documents, this will take us through 24, 25, and partway through 26 before the project is advertised and the contractor can bid on the project. We're probably not looking at breaking ground until at least the end of 27 um, with final with final construction probably wrapping up sometime in the 29 time frame. Final site restoration might even linger into the 2030 time frame, just depending on impacts, park restoration, and some of the details we have yet to figure out. In terms of project costs, uh, there are two buckets of money floating out there. There's the intersection funding and there's the bridge funding, right? So they are two separate buckets of money, even though we are pushing these projects forward as one project. The bridge itself received that raise grant to 24.8 million. That project is being split with 80% federal funding, 10% state and 5% each to Burlington and Winooski. The intersection is 100% federally funded. The overall project with construction, design, 
oversight, right of way, everything all together. The entire project is slated to be roughly 60 to $8 million. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, questions from the committee? Uh, yeah, so on uh, May 2nd of this year, I sent to uh, DPW um, a list of questions, and I don't want to go through all of them. I know that what Laura had told me was that these were going to be integrated into uh, documents that were going to be shared. So I'm, and these re these related to the intersection, not to the um, to the bridge itself. Um, so I am interested in knowing how where they are now in this uh in this process and if you know and i can get this subsequent to this meeting if that's easier that's that's fine but there was a, a bunch of detail uh the email was sent to chapin actually and then we had a couple of things back and forth but it's it was in advance of a um a, a two meeting so there is that and then one comment about the bridge, which I had not focused on yet, but there is a real question about the safety of there being a shared use path over the bridge with both pedestrians and bicyclists. And, you know, that being really problematic in the constrained or confined space. One thing on Riverside Avenue, I use it on Riverside Avenue for both biking and when I run um, from my house in the old North End, that's not a problem because people can move on to green belts and get a little bit onto people's property. Uh, you can't really do that if you're on the bridge. So, and with 300 uh, pedestrians now, um, we don't have, there wasn't a number for the bikes that are crossing, but all improvements will lead to increased volume of, of bikers, uh, I think naturally, and I think that's what we really want as well. So that's a concern that um, I have had, that I have uh, based on what I saw and what has been articulated to me from constituents. Yep, so I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the May 2nd email off the top of my head that you're referring to, but certainly it's something we can go back and take a look at what those concerns are and look to address those or answer those. Um, so I'm, I'm going to unfortunately pass on that unless Laura, I, Steve, Mike. I, I can speak to it just a little bit. Uh, Gene, those comments have been incorporated into the RFP that was used to procure HNTV. So they've actually incorporated that into their proposal to us about the safety improvements around the bike ped intersection concept, um, just going even a little above and beyond how the, uh, uh, sorry, my son's here. Um, and just making sure that some of those improvements are looked at as we advance the concept through design. So that's where a lot of his comments currently landed, Josh. This is, that was Councillor Bergman that was speaking. It's, we can hear you guys great. You're just- I'm far away. You're smaller in the background there. <laughs> Been smaller than um so I, I think that what i would love is to get where those ideas have landed in the work that's being done now and and, and the analysis that's happening now if they've been in, if they've been incorporated into the rfp that's great you know what does that mean now that we are you know, we are where we are in terms of planning, in terms of its input, um, reflections on them, if no decisions have been made, um, interests or and, and conflicts or however you want to put those two things together so that um, I get a, a sense of the thinking as they as it relates to those um, issues and um, I definitely don't need them now. Thank you, Laura, for reminding me of um, where this, of where they, they got rooted to. Um, great. Thank you. Yep. So so we, we can still provide some guidance on that. Um, I mentioned it's 100% federal funding. The funding took a little while to get in place, so we're not as far along with the intersection as we are with the bridge. We're doing a little bit of catch up now. 
Uh, so I probably don't have any of these specific answers now, but as we get into those answers, I'm happy to share them. Thank you. Of course. Um, and then as far as the bridge goes with the concerns over the shared use path and the, the use of bikes and pedestrians, we've heard similar concerns at the public meeting and some others too. So we are looking into measures to help people stay separated on, on that path, whether it's striping, signing, different guidance. It has been somewhat of a focal point, and we plan to talk about that a little bit more over the next couple of, next couple of meetings and really at the public meeting as well. Thank you. Of course. Um, I had, um, uh, thank you for that presentation. I had questions, uh, two questions. One is around the alignment slide that you had up briefly with the, um, Consideration of different alignments be to facilitate bridge construction and minimize closure. Is that why you're considering different um, bridge alignments? That, that's exactly correct. Yep. So we'll we'll share some additional uh, phasing graphics at our public meeting. But the intent of going with kind of a shifted alignments would be that we'd only have to actually reduce traffic to two lanes for part of the time. And one of the innovative things that we're looking at is actually closing the southbound lanes and detouring southbound only. And it sounds a little bit perhaps counterintuitive, but it results in a lot of right hand turn movements. So it actually improves the efficiency of a lot of those interchanges or a lot of those intersections. So we're going to talk through that in a little bit more detail. But, but yes, you're absolutely right. The reason for the alignment shift is because it reduces some of the construction risk, reduces some of the impacts to the public and generally speaking, should just reduce project costs altogether. Thank you. And then my, my other question is, um, I was selected to be on the project advisory committee and we had like one meeting, I think it was back in September and I haven't received a notice of any additional meetings. So I was just wondering if you knew when the next one of those might be. Off the top of my head, I don't know the next meeting, but I, I thought there have been two so far as well. So. Okay. I will I will follow up and make sure you're on the email listing. Okay. I know that there was a public meeting that came out of the first meeting, um, but I didn't know if there was another. Meeting. So thank you for that. Yep. Uh, I don't have any other questions. So. Um, well, I, I guess that the only other thing is so in terms of this committee and reports, uh, what is the uh, the schedule? What what are, what are we, you know, what are we going to get back when? Um, so I, I think, Gene, it's helpful to share that um, the project team is looking to bring forward to the City Council a presentation uh, at the January 16th meeting so that we can share this with the entire Council. It relates to the Section 106 and starting informing all the councilors of the upcoming agreement that will be in front of them. Following that, there is the uh, next public input neighborhood meeting that happens on the 23rd. I'm sorry, I don't have that date in front of me. Yep, that's correct. Okay. Um, that one is at 6:30. It's being held in Winooski at their Performing Arts Center. We did look strongly for a location uh, approximate in Burlington, and we just didn't feel that there was any facilities large enough to handle what we anticipate for a turnout. So it was a hybrid meeting um, for this time, and then we will talk with our PAC and ensure that uh, Councillor Barlow is also there about a location for future meetings. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, we can thank thank the presenters and, um, and close this item, I guess. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, uh, you. thank you. And, uh, and we'll move on to our next item, which is the uh, carbon pollution impact fee item. And as promised uh, at the beginning of the meeting, we'll have another public comment uh, section specific to this item that will will begin now. Um, and what I will say, I, I'm not sure how long this is going to go, but we may have to, if it goes to the 10 of 6 time frame, we'll probably have to end public comments of be advised of that ahead of time um, and, and defer to our next meeting. I'll also say, if you're not able to speak tonight, we, we would welcome written comments, which we will include with the meeting record. And I know um, at least one person who's submitted written comments already. And so with that, I'll open 
the public comment. Um, and I'll go back to first, the two speakers from before, I had a, um, a Luce Hillman who was online Are you still with us, Luz? Okay. Yes, I am. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Luz Hillman. I'm Executive Director of Facilities Management at UVM. And uh, I want to say that, you know, UVM is very interested, of course, in reducing our carbon footprint. And we're working hard on our own sustainability plan and energy master plan. And we've been very involved with the Ordinance Committee on developing the carbon impact fee ordinance the City of Burlington has recently passed. So this came a little bit as a surprise that it's being changed when we haven't had the opportunity to implement it. Uh, we, you know, we noticed the 25,000 square foot building size instead of 50,000 square foot. And also in the ordinance, 50% of the payers' fees could be used on their own property to help reduce their carbon footprint. And that seems to be removed in this amendment. Also, um, the I want to say that the uh, state of Vermont is still working on the clean heat standard, and I'm on the technical advisory committee, and we are working very hard on that standard, which will also impact lower and middle income people and help them weatherize and do other improvements to their home. So I would like to recommend that this not be um, brought forward to voters because we've already spent a lot of time developing a good carbon impact fee ordinance with the city of Burlington. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Luce. Um... I'm going to go to one other online person that we asked to wait, and then I'll go to in room. Um, and that person was, I believe, Gary. Yes, that's correct. Go ahead, Gary. Hi, my name is Gary Scott. I'm the senior vice president for planning, design, and construction and real estate for the uh, University of Vermont Health Network. We're just concerned about the process uh, proposed around the ballot item. It, we feel that it undermines the process we've already gone through, a very thoughtful process that we've worked hard with um, the city on. The um, the carbon fee increase and removal of renew renewable, renewable energy credits in the proposed ballot item would have a substantial impact on the hospital's budget, but we can at least afford it at this time. It will increase the cost of patient care to our patients in the, in the state of Vermont, which we feel is a, a huge negative outcome. Um, despite how much we value our partnership with BED and VGS uh, on the District Energy Steam Project, all of that work that we've been working so hard on to, to make this come to fruition will have to be paused until this is resolved. Finally, advancing the ballot item would almost certainly prohibit our ability to expand our physical hospital in the city of Burlington in order to meet the health care needs of our community, which means that there would be little to no avenue for partnering with the city on developing renewable energy sources sources which would seem to be the opposite of the goal of moving towards a net zero. We ask that the, um, this committee not advance this proposal at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm gonna go in room now. I know Kelly's been yeah. really patiently. Um, Kelly Devine, I'm the executive director of the Burlington Business Association. Um, because I know we don't wanna take a lot of time, I just wanna ditto everything both of those people said because that was really helpful about process and about uh, giving this uh, piece a chance to show that it can be impactful. Um, this is a, the existing um, carbon impact fee ordinance requires some kind of action to uh, see the resulting reduction in, in carbon output and, um, and there's, potential pen penalties for you know, not going the most efficient route. You don't know if those things are gonna have real impact until you have a chance to see them operating within the community where they're going to, where they're being implemented. Uh, Burlington, I often say Burlington, at least three of Burlington's borders are porous. One of, us, one of them is fairly fixed, the lake. And I have increasing concerns and supportive data around that about uh, small businesses, commercial offices, commercial office tenants moving out of Burlington into South Burlington, uh, into Williston, into Winooski. Part of those decisions have to do with other things that are happening in Burlington that I won't go into, but part of them have to do with um, the cost of being in Burlington. And part of the increased cost of being in Burlington is you know, energy related cost or costs related to energy. These costs will be passed on to tenants because most tenants have what you call a triple net lease, which means you pay 
a fixed lease price and then uh, other costs on top of it. Uh, while the, um, you know, we, we didn't have any significant concerns with the first phase of it, especially since it focused on build such large buildings. I did think that process had a lot of good compromise. When you start to move down to buildings that are 25,000 square feet, you don't necessarily think of some of your smaller shops or um, you know some of the um, smaller stores we have falling into that category, but they really do if they're part of a larger building because it would apply to the building owner. It really depends. In downtown Burlington, we have a whole bunch of buildings of a variety of sizes. So, um, you know, there seems to be, I think there's some concern that some of our, um, some of our small shops will actually be impacted by this. I'm pretty certain that most of our commercial office space that already isn't in, in the pool will be added to it. And we, um, we have um, a vacancy rate now that's about 1% above the average, but we have a lot of phantom offices. I think we're going to see um, a pretty significant reduction in the amount of commercial uh, office space activity that's in Burlington over the next couple of years. I think a real har harbinger of that is the fact that if you want to attend the DPW Commission tomorrow night, you'll see from their recent report out that their number of leases of people that are in garages for five to six day leases has dropped, I think, fourfold at least, if not more, since the pandemic. People aren't uh, coming to offices, many, many, many of our professional uh, office building holders are considering moving out of town. They they are already moving out of town. They vacated and are still paying rent till their till their lease expires. Um, we're going to continue to see that trend because for several reasons, including it's part of a national trend of people not necessarily doing five days inside an office anymore. Um, so um, I think anything that puts pressure on that that doesn't seem to be have been vetted the same way the first half of the process is, is something that raises concerns for me. Um, I think we need to slow down on this. Um, as Mr. Goodguy said, and someone I don't often disagree with, I mean, agree with, so that was kind of nice, especially with the Santa hat, very festive. Um, we have other election opportunities in, in, uh, in 2024 to address this issue. So. Uh, I'm going to um, ask again that the committee um, consider not advancing this proposal. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I see General Manager Springer, were you here to speak on public comment or support questions later? But the latter. Okay. Is there anybody that is uh, yeah. public? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Online vote next. Um, so, Maddie, if you want to just sort of serve them up and Chris May. Yes. Hello, my name is Chris May. Uh, I'm a volunteer with 350 Vermont, also a parent of a two-year-old daughter. I'm a Burlington resident. I live in Ward 2. Um, asking the committee to please take climate action by passing building decarbonization tonight and letting the voters decide on the March ballot. Um, and also in the spirit of saving time at tonight's meeting, just wanted to share that I'm Speaking on behalf of a few other friends from 350 Vermont's Burlington Node, who are also remotely on this call, um, Kim Harnung Marcy, Marcy Cass, Andrew Simon, and Brian Forrest, uh, volunteers for the Burlington Node of 350 Vermont, and also here asking the committee to pass building decarbonization. Thank you. Chris. Nick Presentieri. Bruce Thank you. Can you hear me? We can, Nick. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, as I think was made clear, and as I think a number of the city councilors agreed during the course of some of the prior committee hearings, the ordinance that is on the books now is seriously flawed because it only imposes a carbon impact fee on fossil fuel heating systems, but not on non-fossil fuel heating systems that also emit greenhouse gases. So it perversely creates an incentive for using those non-fossil fuel systems that emit greenhouse gases, including um, renewable gas, liquid biofuels, and advanced wood heat. 
just to give you an example, it's it creates an incentive for if a new home is build, built for a new furnace to be installed that runs on renewable gas. This is not what we want to be promoting in Burlington, especially with regard to new buildings, which are low hanging fruit. We know they can be built with sufficient weatherization to allow them to run on electricity. So the only way to fix these perverse incentives is to impose a fee on all systems that emit fossil fuels. And unfortunately, the only way we can do that is by going back out to voters because the charter change says if you want to impose a fee, it has to be approved by voters. It's really too bad we didn't get this right the first time. When I saw this ballot item, I was horrified. And this is actually what turned me into a local activist. You know, we we pounded the pavement to try to defeat the ballot, the first ballot measure. Of course, we had no luck. Um, so I really think you need to fix this. And um, there was some language written in in an attempt to uh, blunt the possibility of these perverse incentives being realized, saying someone would have to cert submit a certification if they rely on something other than electricity or, or a solar or geothermal. But that certification is really broad and it would include proof that something's economically unduly burdensome. Well, electricity is relatively expensive, so someone could claim that it's it's more, electricity is more expensive, so therefore I'm going to put in advanced wood heat. We just don't want this happening. Um, and my last point is, all this ballot measure does is give the city council the authority to fix the problems I've identified. It does not change the ordinance in any way. There's going to be plenty of process going forward for everyone to be heard. And as a result of that process, it might be that we agree not to raise the fee or that we don't go down to 25,000 square feet feet or larger, but we have an urgent issue that needs to be dealt with. Let's put this on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. Neil Lunderville. Go ahead, Neil. Uh, hello, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Neil Lunderville. I'm the president and CEO of VGS, Vermont Gas Systems, and formerly the general manager of the Burlington Electric Department, uh, where I served for four years doing some great work, uh, working to help make Burlington uh, a more renewable city and working toward the goal of, of making Burlington a net zero energy city. Work that we're still working on here at VGS, uh, working with uh, Darren at, at the Electric Department and other partners around the city. Um, I've come tonight to uh, ask you to, uh, to consider not advancing uh, the resolution to uh, change the ordinance that was just passed uh, by the Burlington City Council uh, for a couple reasons. Um, one is uncertainty. Uh, I think as, as other speakers have just talked about um, the ordinance that was worked on for many months uh, with a lot of consideration literally just passed the City Council just a few weeks ago. And by now making a, a change to that uh, ordinance or proposing to make a change, you're injecting real uncertainty into uh, what what the policy will be. For folks who want to make changes in this space, including us, as we work to decarbonize our portfolio of services that we serve to customers, uh, uncertainty means that we wait and see, and that means we're not taking action. Burlington has already passed an extremely progressive uh, ordinance to decarbonize uh, buildings in Burlington. 
uh, it's time to let that ordinance work for a while and make changes after careful study and see how it works. Um, we're not, a, we're not, you know, we are always looking to make um, uh, policy better. We want to be a partner in that, but we also need to give policy time to work. The second point I want to make is about affordability. Um, I know uh, you care about this deeply, as do we. We serve 15,000 customers in Burlington. We're one of the cheapest ways to serve energy, although we know one of the inherent flaws that we have is that we are uh, contributing to greenhouse gas, to, to climate change with greenhouse gas emissions. We also need to make sure as we decarbonize, we do so in a way that our customers can afford. And this resolution proposes to increase that carbon impact fee by 57%. Um, we know because we've heard from our customers that they are already uh, working hard to manage their cost and they can't afford anymore, whether um, whether it's uh, energy bills or grocery bills or housing bills, whatever it is. So we want to be really careful before we're imposing any new cost on them. That's residential customers and business customers alike. The last point I'll make is a point made by a couple other speakers, including Luce and, and Gary, um, is that we have uh, uh, one of the most progressive energy policies in the country in Act 18, the Affordable Heat Act, also known as the Clean Heat Standard. Um, we need to give that, that law, which is statewide, applies to all of Vermont, uh, time to work. The Public Utility Commission is in the, in the middle of building a regulatory process around making that work. Um, as Burlington continues to uh, change its, uh, or proposing to change its ordinance, uh, I, I am concerned that Burlington will move at 90 degree angle from where the state is. And again, this creates uncertainty and it creates doubt and it causes people to pause in their actions. We cannot let people pause. We have to keep moving forward in a very aggressive way uh, to beat that climate change. But to do so, we need a stable policy base from which we can work. So I would encourage the committee uh, to not let this, this resolution move forward. Take the time to let Burlington's just passed ordinance work uh, VGS will continue to be a, a great partner uh, to the city in those efforts and making sure that our customers say, stay safe and warm in every season. Uh, thanks for the time today. Thank you, Neil. Jack Hansen. Go ahead. Can you guys hear me? We can. Go ahead. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I just want to remind folks, you know, this is part of a process that we're in in the city. In 2019, we declared a climate emergency we set the ambitious goal of eliminating emissions from all buildings um, and eliminating fossil fuels, fuel use in all buildings uh, by 2030 with the net zero energy roadmap. Um, and I think we're all committed to that. Um, but the thing is, in order to get there, it's going to take a lot of work um, and it's going to be difficult work and it's going to require leadership. We've taken some small steps in the right direction. Um, towards that goal, but we still have a long way to go. And I think I think that was acknowledged kind of throughout the process thus far of the existing um, ordinance. You know, we got voter approval in 2021. So two and a half years ago, you know, with the voters saying the city can regulate thermal energy in buildings, um, including using fees, but the fees would have to be approved by voters. Um, we ultimately got this uh we got some level of authority on the fee side and we developed this initial policy which really in my mind is, is very much just a starting point it is looking at um you know commercial and industrial um <clears throat> buildings above fifty thousand square feet so about 80 buildings in the city so that that starts to touch on you know some of where we need to go but it still leaves a, a long way to go and even within those 80 buildings, you know, the, the policy that we have on the books, the ordinance is specific to at the point at which someone is getting a new system. And, and I think that's critical that folks getting a new system, that the city should nudge them towards, you know, getting the, installing a system that doesn't emit. Um, but again, it's, it's going to take a lot more than that to, to get where we need to go. And so I think this, this is a continuation of that work. I appreciate you all for for doing this work. I think there's a lot of great examples from other cities. You know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here in Burlington. So I hope you'll continue in earnest to try to move forward um, policies that can move us closer to this shared goal of eliminating emissions in, in our building sector. Um, thanks so much. Thank you, Jack. 
There's no more public comment. Um, Ashley Adams. Hey, Ashley. Hi there. Hi. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> appreciate you taking public comment uh, during the meeting. I was helpful. It allowed me to be here. Um, I, you know, with all due respect, I don't think you can call climate policy in Burlington progressive when you have a 50 megawatt biomass plant in your backyard. Um, the ordinance that um, voters thought they were getting is not the ordinance that they got. Uh, it's a deeply flawed piece of legislation that allows for renewable natural gas, um, advanced wood heat, biofuels, and that is really problematic. That is not um, by any means progressive uh, climate ordinance, and it needs to be fixed and voters deserve to weigh in again and have an opportunity to demand that the city correct the ordinance that's on the books. Um, so please allow that to happen and please recognize that it is, um, as a previous speaker indicated, a process. Um, it is not an ordinance. Uh, it, it's a process that voters deserve to vote on. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Is that it? That's the only people have their hands raised. Okay. Is there anybody else who's listening online who wishes to speak uh, to this item in uh, public comment? Please raise your hand to be recognized. Nobody? Okay. <laughs> then I'm going to go ahead um, and close public comment. Um, and uh, I guess I'll open it up to the committee to sort of decide on how we want to move forward. How do, how do we want to play? Sure, you can start. I don't sure. think that's like an well, open uh, First of all, I think that uh, we clearly have a short of time today yeah. to get into the details and make decisions. And I am an advocate of moving forward on this. So clearly I, I, I'm not folding to the contrary um, opinion that's been expressed. So I would love for us to have a, another meeting that would allow us to meet the mandate of the council resolution uh, to be able to report back um, to, the, uh, um, to the council in time for us to um, have an action on, uh, on January 29th. I think that we have a meeting set for the 23rd which is the Tuesday, but we, that can work to be able to get something to the uh, to the council for the next Monday, which I believe is you know, the, the 29th and when we're meeting. So we have a full council meeting on the 29th. I believe we have a full council meeting on the 29th. Would that be oh, oh, our meeting here, Tuk on the 20th? The 23rd, yes. So our meeting on the Took on the twenty third, correct? Yes. So meeting. So us meeting. Um. In time to do that. Now we're also. It's also meeting on the council is also meeting on uh, on the sixteenth, and perhaps given the um the desire to um put enough time into this that there is um, a, a, the ability for us to meet the week of January 8th um, would seem to be uh, prudent. Um, so that's sort of the the first. Yeah, I would prefer that um, if we met the week of the 8th to talk about this. I think I would prefer that as well. That sounds, I prefer that as well too, oh, actually. Yeah, I mean, nice. y'all agree. I mean, to be able to give us the, the sufficient time to uh, to do the work that needs to, uh, to be done. So we're talking about trying to find a uh, time, the, looking at January, the week of the 8th, um, I mean, are there, are there preferred days of the week? Um, and I would ask that of Maddie and staff as well. Um, let me 
and for a conference room as well. And we, we might anticipate needing a slightly larger space if one is available. It is booked every day that week. There is availability before a NPA, um, or five NPA is at six on Thursday. So we could try to do it <laughs> in an hour and a half or so before as early as how, how would folks think feel about going back to spark space or one of those other alternative spaces or i would i would be okay with that the ninth is also which is a tuesday this is our traditional meeting with the and the um sharon busher conference room is available on thursday oh wait i'm looking at the wrong week hold on the ninth of uh, tuesday the ninth of january um it is not available that day. I was looking at the wrong week. Hold on. Which room? The Sharon oh. the conference room. But uh, the DPW conference room is available on the 10th. It's Wednesday the 10th. Wednesday the 10th, all, all evening. So I have a sort of a major conflict um, at 7 30 that night. but. I would, depending on it being earlier, I would. When we do pick a time, I, I would prefer just to leave it so we're not we're not constrained by other. Yeah, yeah I can do any any day that week is fine for me. So I have. I, I as well. So the June. Yeah. So whatever works best. So the ninth is, I think, the best day for me. Okay. Tuesday the the ninth. Is there space anywhere on the ninth? Not in at uh, uh, DPW, but I can continue to look. Okay. Um, and circle back with you guys offline to make okay. sure it might be. Uh, Thursday the 11th is also um, time, but I think that that puts us into if we were to want to do something for the council meeting on the 16th, if that were to happen, then um, that, that jams that up. It up because we're well because of deadlines, you know. Right, and the ninth also does. Well. Oh, yeah, but that's a little less uh, problematic, and we can put in a, a placeholder and, and meet that on the tenth if need be. And since the oh, I see. committee and and since they were until right. Friday, you know, yeah. not the whole. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm open to um. Yeah. Whatever either of you would like to do. So I think the night is the uh, the best day. But what then? Let's try to meet on the ninth somewhere to be determined. Um, where? Um, what time would you like to meet at our normal five o'clock time? I can do that. I can do earlier. Yeah, anytime works for me. I can do. I can do either as well. So I'll let you guys. Yeah, you. and if Spark is. Uh, I mean, if, if we're looking at a bigger place versus a smaller place, um, Sparks Place is, is good. I've been generally okay with BD, and they have with me, so. I don't have the access, yeah. so we have to check. Okay. Or, or elsewhere. So we'll say that um, that's to be determined, but it'll be a special meeting of the two to uh, a season finale to do do with this uh, to deal with this one issue on that day. Um, but do we want to talk more about uh, things that we might want to have? Are there anything that we yeah. would ask BED for? I mean, I am I'm interested in understanding the the, the buildings that are feared to be uh, swept up into this a listing of that would be quite helpful um i would like in the nicest way possible and some of you know me to be sharp mouth so <laughs> i'm going to try not to be sharp mouth kelly and i go back a long way on these things so uh, i i i i i I'm, I'm i'm bothered by the broad swipes that UVMMC gave. And so um, I would like to actually understand from UVMMC if they're here, exactly what they're talking about when they say that they have to pause, that it's gonna give, uh, let me just pull up 
The letter. Their letter. Uh, okay, not that one. That's UVM's. I think no. Is this UVMC? Yeah. Uh, who's uh, that, yeah, I get it. It's from uh, Gary Scott. Uh, uh, that they have to pause and create. I, I don't understand how it can, how it creates, and so they should explain it in their own words. How it creates uncertainty that they're forced to plan, to pause. This is a letter that we got. It's dated December seventeenth. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so, yeah. so I'm I'm reading from the third paragraph just to, to be particular. So they make they make claims that it creates so much uncertainty that they have been forced to pause the work on district heating. Now, this, in my mind, does not create it. I, I respectfully disagree with my friends in the room and those online when it says it does it, because all this does is create an authorization. It does not create any law. It does not change any existing thing that we put into place. It doesn't do any of that. And in fact, does not short circuit the process by which we would get there. So I don't understand how this creates so much uncertainty that all the time that they spent working with BED is now has to be put on hold. And there are a number of other things that they claim that I need verification for. I cannot trust that they most certainly would prohibit their ability to expand in Burlington. I do not understand that and want to understand what they mean by that. You know, um, so, and I, I they, they probably make a couple of other allegations here that regard. With regard to the, the things, and I would like, I mean, if this is possible, and I think that there are things that we could get for this next meeting, a listing of the buildings that would be um, covered that Kelly expressed concerns about. And to the extent to which those relate to um, the heating systems, if we can get details about that, you know, I mean, people, it's really easy to be scared and everybody actually should be quite, un, you know, upset about this. The people in Barrie and in Waterbury and in Moortown today are dealing with the uncertainty the, and the fear that is coming from this massive climate disaster that we are all facing. <laughs> And we are all going to be paying for it, right? We don't avoid those costs. So it would be helpful to understand in more granularity when people say we're scared about added costs, who, who's got systems that are being, um, uh, that are going to need to be replaced that are going to be affected by by this, and if it can't happen, uh, I mean, I, this is. Can I ask a question more related to that? Sure, um, you, you, it's okay with me. So I think what I'm hearing you saying is that I'm exaggerating how many buildings it would impact. No, or I'm you asking, see, I just want numbers. Yeah, you want to see evidence of the number of buildings yeah. that imp it impacts, but if the number of buildings that it impacts and the number of heating systems that impacts are quite small. Maybe that's the reality we uncover. Then how can this this measure in any way be equated to the flooding? You're, you're, I, you're, you're asking for. I, I I want some baseline data. People have said that this is going to cause major disruption. I want to understand. And I anyway, think, so I don't want to get into a debate right, here. I, given I think the, it would be. I think one thing for sure is when we approached the last piece and people were working together. We had a really clear list of the buildings, and those were, you know, laid out for everybody before the thing was passed. So and, and we could, we the, this is this is part of the uncertainty is not knowing. Um, and, and this, this, you know, I mean, again, I, I believe that authorizing and and a um. A, a new way, a, a, an additional way. I don't know. The, the words are not coming. The words not right coming to me. But this this change 
does not foreclose that process. But given what I've heard, it, you know, people, um, I think, should, uh, I would like to hear um, some verification to the claims that, um, that are being made to oppose this. So I would, uh, that, that, so that, that's, that's what I'm looking for in that because I, I just got to say that I, like I think probably virtually every other human being would really like to go slow would like to make sure that everything would be able to be vetted out perfectly. So we're absolutely sure that this is things are the, the right thing to do and that we test everything perfectly before we go anywhere. You know, it's just what the human, it's what you do. I, 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 I believe that that has gotten us to the, the edge of the cliff. And um, I do understand that. I just think it's important to remember that the UVM Medical Center is right on the borderline of South Burlington. It's uh, easy to you know I, this by moving a few feet away. I, 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 have, I have seen the effect of economic strikes by people opposed to making changes uh, that need to be made. Um, and they've been fairly drastic, but I but I, I don't want to, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to get into that debate now. I'm just saying that from my standpoint, the, um, we do not have the luxury of going as slow as what I hear people asking us to do. And I really, um, uh, yes, I, I feel that very deeply in my bones for um, for me and old people. We're gonna have to deal with all these things when we're too fragile and for the babies and our babies, babies that uh, that are out there. So that, that's, that's my take on this. Um, I guess just broadly where I'm at right now is I need to have many conversations. Um, I am sympathetic to the outreach that at least I've gotten from business owners in the downtown specifically and understand that there are economic realities to them which make this feel impossible and also I personally do not want to jeopardize the work that was done on district energy I think that many many people before me put a lot into that and so with the new information that we've gotten over the last couple of days, that's a lot to process, but um, I think my thing is mainly conversation and just getting a better grasp on where we're at and, um, and understanding what this actually looks like, so. Okay, thanks. Um, where I'm at, I didn't support this referral um, when it was referred to committee. Um, I had I had proposed an alternative, which was a process that mimicked the process leading up to the last ballot question. Um, I understand it's here now, and we will deliberate on this, and um, you know we will make a recommendation in this committee um, back to the full council, and expect that we will. However, like a bright line for me. Um, is that we just, as as speakers tonight pointed out, just enacted a policy, um, and we need to give that policy time to work. Whether this was a policy that we enacted on um, carbon pollution impacts or a policy on something else that we would um, we would make as a city council, we need we need to be able to show. The people affected by the policy that there's some stability for some period of time under whatever policy you make. So in the case of this, this current ordinance, I would like to see this play out for some period of time and see how it works. Um, and I think the institutions, as we heard tonight, that are affected, UVMMC, UVM, um, they, they, they're asking for that as well. Um, so that's something that I'll be looking for um in any council 
action that, that I think I can support is to allow this to some period to um, be in effect and see what, you know, see what comes of it. Are we collecting carbon pollution impact fees or are we, as we hope, driving behavior for the adoption of, of more um, efficient, um, less emitting uh, thermal systems in the city? So that remains to be seen. Um, and uh, in terms of the other class of buildings that we're talking about, the buildings 25,000 to 50,000 square feet, um, I'm open to a discussion on that, but I, I would first need to understand how many buildings, who they are, um, and I'm very sensitive to this notion that um, if we make, uh, if they are businesses um, and commercial properties in the city, that we make it too onerous of an environment to be here, we're not going to prevent those emissions. They're just going to move them. We're just going to move those commit emissions along with any economic activity that we get out of those buildings to an neighboring community. So I think we have to be mindful of that as we, as we, um, you know, head down this path. But, um, but as it were, um, we're uh, like we decided earlier. We're going to uh, continue to deliberate on this item, um, and we will be convening again on it on. Um, on the 9th of uh, January at a location to be determined. Um, and I think we agreed on five o'clock. So with that, um, if there's no other discussion this evening, I would like to move on and give um, uh, Director Spencer a chance to provide us with a director's report, which is the next item on our agenda. Thank you. Uh, very much. Uh, two quick items. Uh, one is I wanted to let the counselors know that on December 14th uh, last week, uh, we hosted uh, two meetings related to Great Streets Main Street with stakeholders along the corridor. Thanks to Kelly Devine in the room for facilitating uh, the space for one of those meetings. And um, we are continuing to engage stakeholders we have promised a mid-january meeting once we have the construction schedule from the contractor to share uh, with the public uh, number two is that tomorrow night there's a dpw commission meeting december 20th uh, where we will be discussing adjustments to uh, rates in the downtown garages uh, specifically it relates to extending the max daily rate which will just affect people who stay over eight hours in the garages and the hotels who pay half of the max daily rate uh, for those stays. In addition, there's a proposed 5% inflationary uh, increase for monthly parkers. Uh, those uh, will be uh, discussed uh, in, for the consideration of the commission's approval tomorrow night. And we are continuing to look at data and study the on and off street system to have further recommendations either in the winter or spring. Uh, with the COVID recovery not being as quick uh, in our garages, uh, we are projecting somewhere in the range of an $800,000 shortfall this year alone, and uh, fund balance was depleted during COVID. So, we are trying to be responsible stewards of the parking facilities fund while uh, minimizing the financial impact uh, for folks coming downtown. So more, more to come, but I wanted to at least give you a briefing on those two items. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and with that, the next item is counselor items. Are there any, anything? No, I don't have anything either tonight. So um, the last item is um, our next, not a special meeting, but our next regular meeting, which is scheduled for the 23rd of January at our normal time, Wednesday at five. Yep. Does that work for everybody still? Yep. Okay. Then we will that do that. Tuesday at five? What was that? Did, did Tuesday, you Tuesday, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, if that's it, then we're ready to adjourn. I right, would have to adjourn. We don't have to leave the It's the second part. And I don't believe there's going to be any discussion on that. So.
So, and, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned at um, five. Aye. Aye.